Hello and welcome everyone to our very special and important event this evening. My name is Leanne and I'm the president of KCL Students for Justice for Palestine at King's College London and I will be your chair for tonight. We are very excited to be co-hosting this event today with the Palestine Solidarity Campaign on being united against racism and resisting, against, and resisting Israeli apartheid. Israel's system of institutionalized racist discrimination amounts to the crime of apartheid under international law. And this webinar tonight, part of this week's Israel, Israeli Apartheid Week 2021, will explore how Palestinians and their allies around the globe resist Israeli apartheid. Of course, this includes through the Palestinian-led boycott, global, global Palestinian-led boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, which works to target companies and institutions, aiding Israel's violations of international law. History has shown us that when movements for justice unite to take on oppressive structures, we can and we will win. Liberation struggles must therefore work together against institu institutional racism and oppression, challenging unjust systems of power together. This webinar tonight will also touch on how you can build a movement in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice and equality on your university campus. Today, we are honored to be hosting four amazing speakers, William Shoki, Larissa Kennedy, Ben Jamel and Ahmed Belhorti and we are so excited to hear from them all. Before we begin, I'd just like to note that there will be a Q&A at the end, so please post your questions in the, in the chat. Moderators will pick these out so they can be asked to our speakers at the end. Please keep all contributions in the chat respectful and consistent with the values of KCL SJP and PSC, including an in opposition to all forms of discrimination. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is William Shoki. William is a writer and activist based in Johannesburg. He's an activist with the South African BDS Coalition, and he has been involved with a variety of campus initiatives at the University of the Witwatersrand, and he's also a staff writer of Africa as a Country. Today, William will be speaking to us about the role of global student movement and student solidarity activism in South Africa. So William, over to you. Thank you so much, Leanne, and a tremendous big extension of thanks to the PSC for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, it's been a very busy week, this Israeli apartheid week, as I'm sure everyone who's attending today has been doing, attending different events, and all of these events united under the theme, United Against Racism. And I wanted to begin my reflections today because uh, there are a series of ongoing reflections rather than any kind of speech or presentation to talk about what's been happening in South Africa during this week. So this has been a very fraught and intense week in South African politics. The reason for this has to do with protests which began on my campus, in fact, at the University of the Witwatersrand. And through the efforts of a number of students, including some of my own comrades, uh, some comrades on the Wits Palestine Solidarity Council, the SRC, many different student organizations. And what erupted on our campus and which is now spread to multiple campuses in South Africa is effectively the third wave of, of Fees Must Fall. So to remind everyone about what Fees Must Fall was, Fees Must Fall was a series of student protests that emerged on South African campuses in 2015. Uh, those happened after Rose Must Fall first came about, which was a protest movement that initially had the intention of removing a statue of Cecil John Rhodes from the University of Cape Town's campuses and spread to Oxford at some point during the year. And Fees Must Fall came about as a protest movement whose main goal was the achievement of free tertiary education for South Africans. So South Africa, despite overcoming apartheid, still is a tremendously unequal country that inequality is heavily racialized. And so the majority of black working class South Africans still don't have access to education. So fees didn't fall. 
in 2015 and 2016. The problem sort of just was swept under the carpet and the South African government, I think, hoped that most people were too exhausted and would have forgotten about the problem, but it's come back again. And the protests began at my university because the SRC demanded that all students who were eligible to register for the academic year, regardless of whether or not they owed historical debt to the university, were able to do so. And once protests had began last week, they spilled out to the suburb just outside of the university. And naturally, as they always do, the police showed up and it turned violent. And a passerby by the name of Ntokoziz in Tumba was shot and killed by the police. But what was interesting about what happened in South Africa is that I think it was two days after the killing of Ntumba, uh, protests happened in, in London, where some of you are based at the moment, uh, to honor Sarah Everard and to protest against sexual violence against women. And that protest was, was violently shut down. So I think coming into today's event, uh, what I've been reflecting on is how we are seeing an increasing pattern. And this pattern has been in place for many, many years, but it's one that's starting to exacerbate. It's starting, it started to exacerbate last year after the eruption of Black Lives Matter globally, but an increasing pattern of securitization and the police cracking down on our inalienable rights to protest. And for a lot of people, I can imagine this to be a very frustrating moment, a deeply concerning moment and a deeply troubling moment. And as you guys all know, there is currently a legislative process underway through your parliament to potentially pass the police crime sentencing and courts bill, which will have enormous ramifications for the right to protest in the United Kingdom. And similarly in South Africa, there has been a process during the COVID-19 lockdown to curtail the rights to protest. And so political gatherings of the kind that we are prone to do, of the kind which this webinar is a substitute for, might become a limited reality in our futures. And what I think it provides us an important opportunity to do is to connect what is happening to us and what is starting to affect our societies with what has been affecting the Palestinians effectively for time immemorial. And it provides us an opportunity to understand the struggles which are happening in our communities, on our campuses, as playing a part in contributing to the struggle against oppression across the world of which the struggle against Israeli occupation is a key struggle. And what I think the relevance of the struggle is for universities in particular is that it forms a part of a wider trend in which conditions of austerity, which our governments are starting to implement again as the economic crises, which was prompted and exacerbated by COVID-19 starts to affect their pockets. And the university is increasingly diminishing as a space in which ideas can be contested and in which social justice struggles can be advanced. It's increasingly becoming neoliberalized, it's increasingly becoming commodified, and those general conditions of austerity and constriction are going to have an effect on our ability to critique structures of power around the world, to critique structures of oppression, racism, and imperialism around the world. And heading into this period, it can seem incredibly frustrating and terrifying, right? We start to think to ourselves, well, now we've lost our ability to speak because no matter which platform we speak on, there's going to be tremendous obstacles to the capacity to speak. There's going to be people who want to censor that speech and who want to police that speech. But I want to sort of rather than dwell on how this is going to be doubtless an extremely challenging period that we're all entering, how I think the patterns which are starting to emerge globally, the connections that we're all starting to form globally 
actually are an opportunity for us to develop strength. And what I think is different about the Palestinian solidarity struggle in this moment in history and where it was located in previous moments in history is that now populations more than ever are able to resonate with the experiences of the Palestinians. Ordinary South Africans are increasingly starting to understand what it is like to face the might and force from the police every single day for doing nothing at all. Ordinary South Africans and students South Africans are starting to understand what is it like to be on university campuses where you don't have the ability to speak freely anymore. Something which affects Palestinian students, for example, um, the, the case of Omar al kiswani in 2018, if everyone recalls, where he was arrested by plainly dressed Israeli uh, forces and hoisted off campus, uh, thrown into a van and driven away. That is starting to happen in South Africa as well. Revelations into what we call state capture, which is basically corruption, uh, uh, a corruption scandal affecting and implicating the government. Uh, a commission into that corruption revealed very recently that the South African state, uh, South African uh, state security agency during Fees Must Fall hired these agents to infiltrate university campuses and to pinpoint the people they thought were the most troublesome and the people they thought were the biggest nuisance for the gov government. This is something we as students never would expect to face in a post-apartheid South Africa. Crucially, a post-apartheid South Africa, a democratic South Africa, this is something that is starting to affect us again. And this is something that has been affecting the Palestinians for a long while as well. And so I think it's, it's worth noting, for example, that the protests that began on, on my campus this last week was something that were initiated by the Vitz Palestine Solidarity Committee, of which I'm a part of. A statement that we released drew the connections between the struggles Palestinian students were facing and the struggles we South African students are facing now. And I think that has to be the entry point for the campus movements that we build heading into the future is showing how increasingly the global economic power structure of which resources are still concentrated in the hands of a tiny few and the rest of the world are left in conditions of exclusion and are left in conditions of effectively apartheid, whether that implicates questions of race, class, gender, or even health, for example, during this pandemic where the global north, for example, has instituted a vaccine apartheid against the global south where I am, what we need to do is draw the connections between all of these different struggles and show how the Palestinian liberation struggle is able to express all of the different struggles that we are currently facing and all of the different struggles that we are currently waging and to show how this provides us for an opportunity for renewed strength, an opportunity for renewed momentum, that we are not alone. We are truly not alone. And I think Palestinian people have felt alone for a long period of time, but it is important now to, for us to remind them that they are not alone, but for us to remind each other that we are not alone as well, and to draw from what we can learn wherever it is we are waging our struggle, whether it's Black Lives Matter in the United States, whether it's NSARS in Nigeria, whether it's protests against the military junta in Myanmar, whether it's protests in Hong Kong, whether it's protests in Chile, the fact that I'm able to name a seemingly endless list of countries where populations are challenging their oppression, I think is significant because we haven't been in a moment like this since the fall of the Cold War. The, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. We haven't really been in a moment like this. So to conclude my remarks tonight, I think it's, it's, it's an auspicious occasion because it also marks the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune. And re regardless of your politics uh, and what you might think of what the Commune meant for history, what kind of politics it represented, I think Karl Marx's attitude about the Commune and his observation about it were correct, which is that it was a harbinger for the kind of society that we want to build. And I think what we should take solace in, what we should take comfort in, and what we should draw strength from is that our solidarity struggles are the harbinger for the society that we want to create across the world. 
And that was what we need to tell people, that the reason we think it is important to show solidarity to the Palestinians isn't just as an empty gesture, isn't just because we want to feel better as people, but because it's a universal struggle. It's a struggle that is able to show us the world that we want to build, the world that we want to build, that we are building now in the struggle that we want to, that, in the struggle that we are waging. And this is a world that is premised on the fundamental values of freedom, equality, and justice. And so as we enter what I think is gonna be a very challenging period for you in the United Kingdom, whichever part of the world you are, for myself in South Africa and in Israel and Palestine, I think we should draw strength from the struggle that we are waging and rest assured that you are not alone, that others are facing it too, and that together we are strong. And that is why they fear us. Importantly, that is why they fear us because of our collective strength. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. That was very insightful. And honestly, it's a pleasure to have you with us here tonight. As a Palestinian, your words mean so much to me, your solidarity. And in indeed, we are not alone. I mean, look at how many people are here tonight, all united against racism, all from different backgrounds, different faiths. And it just shows that this is a humanitarian struggle and we must all come together in solidarity and resist Israeli apartheid. Um, so thank you so much, William. We'll come back to you for questions at the end. Please, if you have any questions for William, put them into the chat. Now I'm extremely honored to welcome our next speaker, Larissa Kennedy. Larissa is the NUS National President, the National Union of Students. Larissa was formerly Education Officer and Deputy President at Warwick Students' Union, and she has worked as Advocacy and Campaigns Officer at Plan International, a global gender equality charity. In a volunteer capacity, Larissa is the UK's representative to the Global Secretariat at Youth for Change. She was formerly a member of the British Youth Council's trustee board and UK Youth Delegate to the Council of Europe Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. Tonight, Larissa will be speaking to us about the role of the National Union of Students in supporting student campaigns. So Larissa, over to you. Thank you so much, Leanne. Uh, and I'm really hoping that my Wi-Fi pulls through. It's been very, very dodgy today. Um, so please, someone give me a shout if I'm cutting out at all. But hi, as I just said, my name is Larissa. My pronouns are she, her, and I have the joy and privilege of being NUS president. And first off, I just want to start by declaring full solidarity with siblings in Palestine who have historically over decades upon decades and presently continue to bear the brunt of a racist system of apartheid, violation of international law and uh, things which the UK and other such states continue to be complicit in. And I really want to, to center that, that, that complicity as, as we kind of uh, unpack the role of students and, and education in the UK in, in resisting racism and apartheid. Um, now, decolonization is not a metaphor for those seeking liberation from the visceral realities of, of colonial settler activity, and decolonizing education shouldn't be a metaphor for us here in the UK. And, and there are other folks on this panel who can speak to the former far better than I. So I, um, as Leanne just said, want to really focus on our role as students and what that means in relation to universities and student organizing for decolonization, divestment and demilitarization. Universities as we, we know them today are the very product of historical genocide, enslavement, displacement and colonialism the world over. And I will state in, in no uncertain terms that the UK higher education sector as we know it today wouldn't exist without the historical violence experienced by people of colour around the world. But we, we have to recognise that this violence is ongoing and, and these institutions are not only complicit, but tangibly responsible for legitimising and funding violence and terror in the names of the communities that these education providers are supposed to serve. Um, for example, if we look at the study no, War No More report um, that was conducted by the campaign against the arms trade and the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation, they found that at the time of the research, 26 universities had received funding from military organizations and in some cases they've been sponsored by either a public military body like the Ministry of Defense and in others they had millions of pounds worth of investments in arms manufacturing by private military companies uh, with you know BAE systems being a core example um, and so before when I kind of used quotation marks around education providers it was because the marketized university, universities with the funding model that we have today, 
to the premise that profit becomes comes before all else they're not just about education. They are huge corporate entities with masses of economic, social and political power. And it's for this reason that our conversations around demarketization, democratization and decolonization must be intertwined. Um, and, and you know, it's really incumbent upon us to build a grassroots mass movement that's actually capable of uprooting all of these injustices in tandem so that we can build a new. Uh, and people might be listening and thinking, yeah, that sounds great, right? Um, but like for a second, I just want to dwell on what I believe are two of the greatest challenges to us in doing this, because, you know, William touched there on, on some of the authoritarian actions coming from our government. Um, and it really it sparks my, my mind about, you know, some other things that I've heard um, over the past few months. And I just want to touch on those a little bit. Um, and uh, kind of secondly, to touch on the, the dilution and co-option of the decolonial movement within education here in the UK. Um, so yeah, first off, thinking about lots of the lots of the authoritarianism uh, coming out has also been very very present and, and visible in the in the rhetoric about free speech coming from government, which on any close inspection is is actually only about free speech for anyone that the government agrees with, um, and there's absolutely a dog whistle racist lens of this rhetoric. Uh, the the Guardian reported literally two months ago. Um, that a source from the DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, um, said that Oliver Dowden, the Secretary of State, was trying to defend our culture and history from the noisy minority of activists constantly trying to do Britain down, end quote. Um, and we know exactly who they're talking about. We know exactly who they're referring to. We know that when we're critiquing this country and how it's complicit, not only in the Palestinian struggle, but that of siblings in Yemen and siblings the world over, they see that as an attack on them. Uh, and so, you know, when William spoke to the trend of what's happening here, that immediately made me think of that quote from, from the Secretary of State, because this is a worrying trend in what is a continued attempt to shut down and silence folks who are speaking out against racism and this country's complicity therein. Um, and secondly, there, as I was saying, I want to, to touch also on the, the co-option and dilution of what we're doing here, because as is common with the marketized university, they latch on to anything that is or that may be profitable. And so as the conversations at decolonization continue to move from the margins to the center of our movement, we're increasingly seeing universities posit the language of decolonization to actually describe surface level equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, and seeing decolonizing, we're seeing decolonization work relegated solely to the curriculum, in some cases even maybe pedagogy, maybe the physical sites of our universities, but they're is this, this worrying trend again, that there is a stark refusal to engage with decolonial activity relating to universities as economic actors uh, and student organizing that is calling for divestment, demilitarization and disarmament. Um, and they want to pretend that, that solidarity with siblings in Palestine is peripheral to the decolonization of education, when in fact the decolonial movement and also the student movement more broadly are inherently internationalist. Uh, you know, when, when William mentioned that the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa, we know that that was a foundational cornerstone that sparked so much of the decolonial organizing that we see here in the UK today. Um, and so I think we have to be really intentional when it comes to continuing to center justice, peace and safety for our siblings in Palestine and for all those experiencing conflict and violence around the world. This is about de-metaphorizing decoloniality in our context. Uh, and we also have to be intentional in recognizing that this is a global fight against war. And so we need to mobilize hand in hand with the global student movements driving forward divestment, demilitarization and disarmament. You know, if, if we take uh, BAE systems as an example, um, being a horrific arms company behind these atrocities and, you know, one of, of many, um, this company is not only heavily tied to UK universities, but also those in the US and Australia too. And so the organizing that we've talked about in this space has the power not only to pose a considerable threat to the academy in the UK, but also across the West, um, the West rather. And, you know, I think that is really, really important to think about. 
So how do we do all of that? Because again, it, it might sound um, like something people want to get involved with, but what does that look like? I guess, you know, for us at NUS, we're, we're currently working alongside student organizers, student officers and grassroots organizations to collectively build the NUS decolonization, ed, ed, <laughs> rather, NUS decolonized education campaign. Sorry, I'm, I'm tripping over my words here. Um, but really the, the nature of the campaign is wanting to continually re-inject the radical roots of decolonization colonial organizing. Uh, you know, we started to build a library of resources. It's a mixed media library. Um, I can chat a little bit about that in a second. Um, really building spaces for political education that can pour into the movement and, and keep sharpening the tools that organizers have to rail against these interconnected injustices. Um, and actually, when, I, when we've spoken about this and when we've um, seen reactions to it, these institutions are scared about this conversation because at its core, this is about the abolition of the university as we know it, um, a construct which is and always has been a site of violence for black and brown folks around the world. And it's about tearing down and building anew. It's about the voices of our siblings in Palestine and all those experiencing war, conflict and injustice being centered in the way that we build anew. Um, and so I hope that folks do come on this journey with us, you know, the campaigns grow in every day. Um, the community is accessible um, to any student, student organizers and student officers. Um, I very briefly there mentioned the mixed media library. It's got free accessible resources that can be used by students and the wider community alike. Um, and the space is, is, is built with the idea that anyone, whether coming into the movement very fresh, someone who's a seasoned organizer, anyone can access something that supports their growth because we, we want people to be getting the, the kind of decol 101 because we need to resist again, as I'm saying, the, the co-option and dilution of what we're doing here. So we need people to get the, the, why this is all interlinked, why it's not just about our curriculum, it's actually about um, divestment from the arms trade, divestment from fossil fuels, divestment from all of these dangerous and harmful practices. Um, and, and it's also, you know, all the way through to materials and things like pinkwashing and homo nationalism, for example. Um, and, and it's not just literature, but podcasts, videos. So however, however folks best access information, there should be something for you. So yeah, if, if that has utility for your local groups, we really do hope that you use and share it. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave a link to, to some of the campaign pages on the website in the, in the chat, but I just briefly want to say that when we're, we're building these resources, we only care that they have utility to the movement, right? Like we, we want these spaces to, to be intentional so that they grow and evolve as the movement does. We want them to be shaped by you, by your expertise, by your lived experience as organizers fighting for the liberation of, of Palestine, but also as Palestinians. Um, and if there are resources we could add to help that process, then please let us know. Because again, I, I'm very conscious, I don't want, um, this, this dangerous narrative um, about, you know, the minor, tiny minority of activists that they're talking about to erase and eradicate the, the really sharp nature of what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, there's also like a, a decolonizers network uh, where, you know, people hang out regularly to learn, to grow, to practice collective care, to build community, because this work isn't easy. And so how do we make sure it's sustainable? We have to keep building community. Um, and, and in this space, we, we remember that all of the black and brown revolutionary abolitionists who have campaigned for years, for decades before us, they had something in common. They weren't working in isolation. So if we want to amass that collective power, we have to connect up our movements. We can't allow institutions to silo and water down decolonial activity. Because as I said at the beginning, decolonization is not a metaphor. It doesn't happen in boardrooms. It doesn't happen in university working groups. It happens through you and through our collectivism. So I guess my, my closing note for folks watching is please do not forget your power as students. For those of you, those students in the room, uh, please do not forget your power as students, the concrete power that you have to organize, to mobilize, to win, because we can and will continue to build a grassroots mass movement that is capable of demarketizing, democratizing and decolonizing education, of mo moving towards the abolition of the university as we know it, so that we can build sites of learning and knowledge that are centered on care, justice and liberation for our siblings in Palestine and for black and brown folks the world over. So thank you so much for having me um, and I'll hand back to Leanne. 
Thank you so much, Larissa. It's a real honour to have you tonight with us as the president of the National Union of Students, and it's great to hear about your amazing work and how you're supporting student campaigns. And honestly, keep it up. We love to see it, and we can't wait to see what else you do. Um, next up, we have Benjamin. Benjamin is the director of Palestine Solidarity Campaign, the largest organization campaigning in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice and equality in the UK. He is also a member of the British Palestinian Policy Council. And tonight, Ben will be speaking to us about the importance of the apartheid narrative and the role of PSD in supporting divestment campaigning. So Ben, it's an honor to have you and over to you. Thank you so much, Leanne. And look, picking up the uh, the threads of uh, of what William was uh, touching on earlier, and 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 Larissa has about the terrain we're inhabiting uh, at the moment. Um, just before we started this, as the speakers gathered in the uh, in the room before the event, William said to me, "How how how are things in the UK at the moment?" Uh, and my honest answer was, "Where do you want us to start?" Um, and I'm sort of conscious tonight. The last time that I was at a meeting organised by KCL students uh, alongside Omar Barghouti was shortly before the pandemic where we faced we had an event where we faced uh, significant attempts uh, to prescribe the event and it went ahead and it was a great success but it went ahead in a highly securitized environment we had to go through several levels of security to attend the event uh, this is one of the few occasions where it's a relief maybe to be on zoom but it's really important uh, that this event is happening uh, tonight. The best way when we are under attack that we defend our space is to continue uh, to enlarge the space. So I do thank the Students for Justice for Palestine for organizing uh, this event. Uh, and we salute them for the continuing activism they're exhibiting uh, on campus. Uh, it is fantastic to have the support of NUS and the presence of Larissa uh, showing solidarity with us this evening uh, and thank you to all of you uh, for in for attending this student-led event and this is one of dozens of events happening across the globe this week as part of Israel Apartheid Week more than 20 events happening across UK campuses we at PSC are very proud to be supporting students holding these events but also students taking forward campaigns uh, to get their universities to divest from companies complicit in Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. And sadly, this support that we offer includes supporting students in resisting attempts to delegitimize these events, uh, to suggest that describing Israel in these terms as a state that in its constitutional order through its enactment of laws and policies meets the definition of a state or a regime practicing of the crime of apartheid attempts to suggest that to describe Israel in this way uh, is an example of anti-Semitic hate speech. This, as we all know, is part of a broader attempt by Israel and its allies to shield Israel from accountability for its violations of international law and human rights conventions by reframing the nature of how we understand what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people. And the acceptable frame of discourse that Israel's keen to promulgate is that reasserted this week, you would have seen it, uh, by Jared Kushner, who in defending or, or to be more accurate, celebrating the Trump deal and its centerpiece of normalizing relations between Israel and authoritarian Arab states, described the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian people as a real estate dispute, neighbors fighting over disputed territory. And from this framing, of course, flow all the other narratives in logical sequence. If this is a land dispute, then you mediate. You don't choose sides. You bring people together in coexistence projects so they can hear each other's stories. You don't point the finger or allocate blame. And God forbid that you employ sanctions or any form of boycott. And of course, then those who make calls for boycott or for sanctions or for Israel to be held to account, for example, at the ICC, be they the UN, be they Human Rights Watch, be they Amnesty International, be they Israeli human rights monetary organizations like Betzalem, and of course, be they the united voice of Palestinian civil society, well, they must, of course, then be inspired by sinister motivations and hatreds. 
So that's why universities have become a key target of this project of delegitimization, because universities, as William touched on, are a key arena where people ought to be able to interrogate truths and facts of history and make conclusions and make the judgments that logically flow from that history. And when you do that, then you discover, you know that this is not a real estate dispute. This is a problem rooted in a process of settler colonialism that was given initial energy by the Balfour Declaration in 1917, that was accelerated under the British mandate, which oversaw and engineered a process of huge Jewish settlement of the land and expulsion of Palestinians, and cemented, of course, by the Nakba of 48, which saw half of the Palestinian population, over 750,000 people, including most of my extended family, driven from the land into exile. And since then, Israel has established a regime of control, which after 67 extended to all of the territory of Palestine. A regime of control that has three central dynamics, control of the population to try and ensure and maintain a Jewish majority through the denial of the right of return to those expelled through policies of further expulsion of the Palestinian population and via laws of immigration that grant the right to immigrate to any Jewish person worldwide, regardless of their established links to the land, whilst denying that right to Palestinians, even if they have documented ancestral, ancestral roots. Secondly, through control of the land, through laws and policies that deny Palestinians the right to own and develop land. And thirdly, through the denial of core rights to the Palestinian people, including basic rights of freedom of assembly, freedom, freedom of movement, and the right to full political participation. All of these are designed to sustain a situation that Betzalem described earlier this year in this way. And I quote that the entire area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River shall be organized under a single principle, advancing the, and cementing the supremacy of one group, Jews, over another Palestinians. This meets the legal definition of apartheid, which the Rome Statute describes as, and a quote again, inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. So just as from Gerard Kushner's illegitimate framing flow logical imperatives and consequences, so do moral and political imperatives flow from the acceptance of the truth that Israel is enacting a system of apartheid. One does not cooperate with any unjust system or structure of power. Before I came to work at PSC, my professional field of work was tackling domestic violence and wider forms of violence by men against women and girls. And a fundamental principle in forming that work was that when you were dealing with a man's illegitimate exercise of power and control over a woman, you didn't seek to mediate, you did not seek to ask the woman to engage in couples counseling so that she could perhaps come to understand her partner's narratives. You sought to hold the man to account for his violence until he addressed and ended that abuse. And until he did so, you sought to employ sanctions and restrictions upon him. Now, some of you will have heard earlier this week the UK business secretary, whose name escapes me, speaking on the radio, speaking to the government's foreign policy review and trumpeting the tired and dishonest argument that it is better and that the UK can, um, pro um, proposes to continue to trade and to maintain friendly relations with rights abusing states, because by doing so, you gain some kind of leverage. Not only is that empirically false, it is morally bankrupt. It is an equivalent moral argument to me saying I'm going to buy goods from somebody who has stolen them from my neighbor, but I will tell him as I hand over the money, you do realize, don't you, that I do not approve of theft. It ignores the truth given to us years ago by Desmond Tutu in the context of the struggle against South African apartheid when he said in a situation of justice and injustice, you cannot be neutral because to be neutral is to be on the side of the oppressor. The first principle of solidarity 
is to say to the oppressed, I stand with you. An injustice to you is an injustice to me. You are not alone. And the second principle is to ask from the oppressed, what do you need from me to support you in your resistance to your oppression? And the answer to that question from Palestinian civil society has been clear and consistent and stark for many, many years. End your complicity. For the UK, this means ending the complicity of our government via its diplomatic, political, financial, and military support for Israel's, Israel's system of apartheid. End the two-way arms trade, and any trade that supports and sustains rights abuses. Support efforts to hold Israel to account, including through the International Criminal Court. For our institutions and public bodies, it means ending all ties and financial investments with companies that support Israel's oppression. And this includes, crucially, universities who, according to research undertaken two years ago by PSC, hold over £750 million in such investments. And that's why the campaigns launched by students across the UK to end those investments are crucial. And finally, to those who say, look, this language of apartheid, this is extreme, this is upsetting, this is uncomfortable, we want to resist usage of such terms. Well, we reply that this is the same argument as those used by those who in the context of Black Lives Matter movement say they feel uncomfortable to be confronted with the realities of Britain's colonial and imperialist past. To such arguments, we echo what Bet Salem say in the conclusion to their report. As painful as it may be, to look reality in the eye, it is more painful to live under a boot. And looking reality in the eye means recognizing and understanding that the Palestinian rights struggle is an indivisible part of the struggle against all forms of colonialism and racism. We cannot bifurcate anti-racist politics. We cannot say we oppose one form of racism, but we support uh, Israel's system and structure of apartheid. And to those finally who try to de delegitimize the Palestinian struggle, including by trying to prescribe events such as tonight, which speak the truth to apartheid, we say this, why are you content to lend your support to enable a regime which demolishes homes simply because they are built by Palestinians? Why are you content to support a regime which builds roads and prevents people driving on them simply because they are Palestinians? Why are you content to support a regime which holds children in detention without access to lawyers and subjects them to torture simply because they are Palestinian? And why are you content to support the regime which refuses to recognize Palestinian villages that have existed for decades, denies them access to water and electricity, literally removes them from the map and then subjects them to demolition simply because they are inhabited by Palestinians. There is no road to a new Jerusalem of a post-colonial and post-racist world that does not travel through the old Jerusalem and end the system of racial injustice that pollutes it. None of us are free until all of us are free. And none of us are free until the Palestinian people enjoy what is their birthright, freedom, justice and equality in their historic homeland. Thank you so much, Ben. Those were very, very important points covered. Always a great speaker, always well received. Um, if you have any questions for Ben, please make sure you type them into the chat or message them to Lewis, um, and he'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. Moving on to our final speaker, a huge honor to have you with us here tonight. Amal Berghouti. Amal is a co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions BDS movement, the largest coalition in Palestine Palestinian civil society. He is also a founding committee member of the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel and a recipient of the Gandhi Peace Award. Tonight, Omar will be speaking to us about the key role that students play in the global BDS movement. Omar, it's an honor to host you here tonight and we are very excited to hear from you. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leanne. I really appreciate uh, uh, your invitation to me. Thanks to all the students that, despite their oppression, are continuing on the path of solidarity and support for anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles. In 1967, 
the late prominent Jewish American writer I.F. Stone prophetically wrote, quote, Israel is creating a kind of moral schizophrenia in world Jewry. In the outside world, the welfare of Jewry depends on the maintenance of secular non-racial pluralistic societies, he said. In Israel, Jewry finds itself defending a society in which mixed marriages cannot be legalized, in which the ideal is racial and exclusionist, end of quote. And those were the good old days. Uh, if I have stone were to see Israel today and how it's treating Palestinians, uh, he would see how prophetic he was. Over the last decade, specifically, Israel has steadily shifted to the far right and its colonization and apartheid policies against Palestinians have grown more violent and criminal, effectively dropping that already torn mask of democracy and liberalism relatively shaking its pedestal and eroding its exceptionalism. Today, as, as Ben mentioned, Metzalem joins many Palestinians and international human rights organizations that have uh, recognized Israel as not just a military occupation, not just a settler colonial system, but also an apartheid system. Uh, as Metzalem says, a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. In direct proportion to this broadening condemnation of Israeli apartheid, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions or BDS movement for Palestinian rights has been growing and its impact multiplying. Inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, the US civil rights movement, and to an extent, the Irish anti-colonial struggle and the Indian struggle, uh, BDS was launched in 2005 by the absolute majority in Palestinian civil society. It calls for ending the 1967 occupation, ending Israel's institutionalized and legalized system of racial domination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and third, upholding the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their lands from which they were ethnically cleansed since 1947 in accordance with UN resolutions and international law. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, BDS rejects categorically all forms of racism and discrimination, be it anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism, sexism, misogyny, homo and transphobia, Islamophobia, and certainly anti-Semitism. Identity should never diminish or restrict one's entitlement to rights. Our movement, therefore, targets complicity, not identity. A growing number of anti-colonial Jewish Israeli BDS supporters play a significant role in the movement. Since Palestinian civil society called last year for a global response to Israel's threats of official annexation of even more of the occupied Palestinian territory on top of ongoing de facto annexation and apartheid policies, the endorsement of political and civil society leaders across the global South has been overwhelmingly positive. 10 former presidents of Latin American countries and South Africa and hundreds of parliamentarians and civil society leaders have endorsed our call, which includes a military embargo and prosecution of Israeli war criminals at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. Just today at the Human Rights Council, Namibia endorsed the call on the United Nations to investigate Israeli apartheid against Palestinians. Israel's birth as a violent settler colony, as Ben has explained, built on the ethnic cleansing of more than half of the indigenous Palestinian Arabs, has been flaunted as a model for far-right and white supremacist leaders worldwide. One of those white supremacists in the US, Richard Spencer, for example, has defended his supremacist movement's racist nationalism as, quote, a sort of white Zionism. This unmistakable allusion to Israel's exclusionary foundations as a state that privileges Jewish settlers over the indigenous Palestinian population, and that today treats African asylum seekers as a cancer, further exposes Zionism as a supremacist movement and elucidates the often obscured contradiction between Zionism and liberal ideals. As this contradiction becomes more visible, support for holding Israel to account is growing worldwide, including, crucially, among Jewish Americans and the broader US public. 
while Israel celebrates its, its um, enormous influence among Western governments and parliaments, especially in the US, UK, France, and Germany, it's missing the growing undercurrent of resentment and apprehension that its apartheid system and specifically its McCarthy anti-BDS anti-democratic tactics are creating. A University of Maryland poll in the US, for example, in 2020 revealed that 72%, almost three quarters of all Americans were opposed to anti-BDS legislation because it infringes on freedom of expression. An earlier poll in 2018 showed that 40% of all Americans, 50%, 56% of Democrats support imposing sanctions or more serious measures on Israel to stop the expansion of its illegal settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. Progressive Jewish groups have played an important role in this overall shift in public opinion, especially in the US, where there's a dramatic flux in liberal Jewish American views on Israel. According to an extensive survey by the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, a right-wing pro-Israel lobby, up to 25% of liberal Jewish Americans, and most Jewish Americans are liberal, 25% of liberal Jewish Americans are, quote, intensely critical of Israel and Zionism itself, including attitudes that Zionism may be a colonial and or racist apartheid movement as practiced in Israel today. If those 25% of liberal Jewish Americans were in the UK today, they may have been called anti-Semitic by your mainstream media. Another survey conducted by the more liberal J Street, another Israel lobby group published in November 2020, shows that 22% of Jewish Americans under the age of 40 support a full boycott of Israel. Part of the reason for this growth of support for BDS is the fact that the movement belongs to the progressive wave fighting the forces of fascism, xenophobia, and savage neoliberalism that Larissa alluded to and William in the university system. BDS has established and nourished bonds of mutual solidarity with movements defending the rights of refugees, immigrants, blacks, women, workers, indigenous nations, LGBTQI communities, and ethnic and religious minorities. A growing number of anti-colonial Jewish Israelis as I said earlier, are very much part of this intersectional uh, wave. Intersectionality, of course, a concept that we've learned from Black feminists in the US, is an organic component of the BDS movement's principles and strategies. At the most fundamental level, BDS upholds that solidarity with the oppressed, as Ben has mentioned, entails cutting links of complicity with the oppressor to do no harm. When Palestinians call for boycotting an institution or divesting from a multinational corporation that is implicated in Israel's violations of our human rights, we're calling for what Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. formulated in his last speech in 1968 as, quote, withdrawing cooperation from an evil system, end of quote. Doing so is hardly charitable, let alone heroic. It is profoundly a moral obligation. In the UK context, solidarity in this sense with the Palestinian struggle for freedom and justice means a ban on arms trade, prohibition of trade with illegal settlements, investigation and prosecution of individuals and corporate actors responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity in the context of Israel's regime of apartheid and occupation, and support for the calls at the United Nations to investigate Israeli apartheid at the very least. The South African Black consciousness leader Steve Biko said, quote, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Indeed, through sustained violence and racist dehumanization, or stubbornly denying our rights, our oppressors try to colonize our minds with hopelessness and to sear into our consciousness rigid limits to our visions of freedom and justice. In the UK, all the bullying and intimidation and witch hunts are meant to intimidate you and have a chilling effect so that no one would advocate for Palestinian rights. It would be too dangerous to go there, but people are resisting. KCL students are resisting and we're so proud of what you're doing. We're a very patient people. 
planting olive trees over centuries has taught Palestinians the virtue of patience. Colonizers come and go, and we remain steadfast. Let's not give in to despair, despite their repression. Let's rise up to the challenge, united against racism, inclusively, intersectionally, ethically, contributing to the struggle for a more dignified world with equal rights and dignity for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hamad. It's great to hear from you as the co-founder of the BDS movement itself. And thank you so much for applauding us at KCL. Um, it's an honor and we can't do this work without you guys supporting us. So thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end. So if you have any questions for Hamad, please put them into the chat. Thank you to all our speakers. You've all been very insightful. I'm sure we've all learned so much from each other. So thank you for your talks. It is now time for our Q&A. So thank you to those who have messaged in questions. Um, if you have any more questions then, Johan, I'm free to message them into Lewis or type them into the chat. So to begin, our first question is aimed at Larissa. So Larissa, I know you touched upon this, but it would be great to hear more from you. So universities talk big about decolonization, but they continue to invest in companies complicit in Israel's colonial domination of the Palestinian people. How can we grow pressure for them to divest? Thank you for that, um, Leanne, and thank you to all the speakers as well. Um, yeah, I guess uh, touching again on, on decolonization and, and what that looks like for, for university communities and for students. Um, we often see with this work that because students operate on a quite cyclical and transitory nature, right? Often people are there for three, maybe four years. And so the universities will um, act as though they've never heard about this before. They will make commitments that they don't follow through on. And then they'll, uh, you know, do it all again with a recycled group of students. And they'll, they'll treat us as though we don't understand that this is what they're doing. Um, and so I think one of the things that we really need to focus on and hone in on is how do we make sure that we are understanding ourselves as just picking up the baton of the student movement, right? Like how do we create sustainable organizing communities so that we can pass down that knowledge of what has happened before so that we can pass down those experiences. Um, and make sure that we are taking it further or that we're taking the next step rather than starting from point blank all over again because I think that's the struggle that I find often with, with the student movement is you come in you're trying to you're trying to scrape stuff together you're trying to do often we do a lot of scrappy campaigning so you're trying to get it up set up fast and do do whatnot and like all amongst your studies and so on and then you get to a point and you realize wait people have got here before so they're they're treating you like um, they're, they're, they're playing they're playing stupid because that serves the, the that, that serves the oppression that they want to continue being complicit in because that is that is how they operate that is how they function and so I think one of the tricks that we really need to learn as, as a movement is how do we solidify the wins that we do secure? How do we pass on the baton in a way that creates sustainability? How do we make sure that, yes, we're always looking ahead to the next cause, but we're also looking behind us and who's coming up and how can we train the next set of act activists and so on? And so I think one of the core things that we're focusing on, on at the moment is what does what does political education look like in a way that pours into the sustainability of our movements? Um, what does um, you know upskilling of, of newer activists look like? How do we pass on those skills, that knowledge and so on? Because otherwise I think we're gonna keep starting and from, from point zero um, and that's not gonna serve the continuity of our movements. Um, and, and it was great to hear there about um, about patience and so on. Uh, it's not something students often have, um, but <laughs> so yeah, I think we're, um, that's, that's something that again, we need to, we need to inbuild that to our, our, um, our movements. We need to be thinking longer term. We need to be thinking beyond ourselves and our iteration of the student movement. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting for me because NUS here is coming up to our, our centenary, we're coming up to our hundredth year and we're thinking about how do we capture those stories to give that kind of longer view of what we're doing here because I think all too often it feels 
pretty it feels pretty centered around this year next year maybe year three but there's so much um cyclic so there's such a cyclical nature to it that often we lose that longevity and that long-term and strategic thinking about how we really implement campaigns that are not only doing the, the surface level work but really uprooting these racist and colonial ties that many of our institutions have 100%, I completely agree. Thank you so much for that, Larissa. Students, I hope you're all taking notes. Um, we will definitely take on your advice within our PAL socks. Our next question is aimed at Ben or Ahmed, either or both. Um, and this is actually something that is prominent right now. And I know a lot of universities are tackling this. A lot of my friends leading Palestine societies are having to deal with this right now. And it is about the IHRA definition. So the question is, can the speakers discuss Williamson's threat to force universities to adopt the IHRA, which is the International Holocaust Rem Remembrance Alliance's definition? And I'm sure you've all seen a lot of this um, in the news. So it'd be great for you to touch up on that. Omar, do you want me to lead off on this and then, and then you can fill the gaps? So look, um, and I think people will know the context of this. This is referring to um, Gavin Williamson's threat, which I think he first issued uh, around October, um, to withdraw funding from universities that had not by Christmas adopted the IHRA. It's worth remembering it is still actually a minority, despite that threat, it is still a minority of universities that have, um, have listened to that threat. Um, it's, it is a deeply problematic process for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, in relation to uh, Williams' attempt to impose the government will on terrain that really should be navigated by universities in, to, in terms of how they deal uh, with issues of hate speech and racism on campus. Uh, but secondly, of course, it's problematic because uh, the definition um, that Williamson's trying to impose uh, on universities is a deeply problematic definition uh, that hinders, not helps, uh, the fight against anti-Semitism and hinders, not helps, uh, a coherent anti-racist position. And, and the reason it does that is because it conflates anti-Semitism uh, with legitimate attempts to hold Israel uh, to account for its abuses of the rights of the Palestinian people. In particular, it attempts to do two things through the examples attached to the definition. Uh, so it attempts to prescribe any attempt to uh, define Israel as a state through its constitutional order, through its laws and policies as a state practicing racism and as a, a state practicing apartheid. And secondly, it attempts to prescribe and define as anti-Semitic any attempt to hold Israel uh, to account and specifically through the non-violent mechanism of boycott, divestment and sanctions. So under those terms, this event is an anti-Semitic event. Virtually every speech you've heard tonight uh, is an anti-Semitic um, speech. So it is nonsensical. It is not just me. It is not just PSC who is saying what I've just said. Uh, this view is supported by numerous progressive Jewish organizations globally. Uh, by numerous academic scholars, including scholars of anti-Semitism, people like Brian Klug, David Feldman, Anthony, Anthony Lerman, uh, by the Institute of Race Relations, even by one of the original authors of the IHRA definition, who has come out and stated clearly that it is being used in a way that is repressive, that suppresses freedom of expression and, and seeks to chill advocacy of Palestinian rights. So it is important that it is uh, resisted. There is growing resistance in universities. An important moment was the UCL's academic board producing a report, the most forensic and detailed study of the impact of um, the IHRA in any public arena, which came to the conclusion that it's not fit for purpose, uh, that it undermines the struggle against anti-Semitism uh, and against all forms of racism, and that the university should rescind its decision to adopt it. We hope that is followed through. We hope that is seen as an example to other universities. The final thing to say is crucial that we continue to defend our space, um, but it is also in, in crucial and important that we do not add to the chilling effect by allowing every conversation about Palestine to become a conversation 
about anti-Semitism. So events like this, where we are encouraging and supporting students to take forward their activism, to take forward their divestment campaigns, uh, to defend the space by continuing to enlarge the space is important as part of our strategy uh, in how we address these issues. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, Omar, do you have anything to add to that about that? Yeah, just, yeah, just something very quick. Um, I think Ben covered uh, everything almost. The, the main point is that this fraudulent, and it is a fraudulent definition, is designed to shield Israel from accountability to international law, as more than 40 Jewish organizations have said in 2018. And it does absolutely nothing to protect Jewish communities from rising anti-Jewish racism, hatred, and bigotry, which is absolutely rising. But they're looking at the wrong place very intentionally. In Germany, for example, a recent police report shows that 96% of all identifiable anti-Semitic attacks, those whose motives were, were decided, come from the right and the far right. That is the main culprit in the rising anti-Semitism. They want to shift the discussion and, and to divert attention instead of focusing on white supremacists and the far right and to see the connection between the fight against anti-Semitism with the fight against anti-Blackness and the fight for Palestinian rights and the fight for women's rights and LGBT rights. That's where anti the fight against anti-Semitism belongs to the social justice movements, to the progressive movements. Instead of doing that, they want to use it as a weapon. They want to weaponize it to suppress Palestinian voices and advocacy of Palestinian rights. And that is not only anti-Palestinian, it's not only racist against us, it's also suppressing uh, uh, real struggles to fight real anti-Semitism, as our Jewish partners have said. Thank you so much for your comments on that. Um, just quickly, because of time, I'm going to move on to the next question. This is a question aimed at any speaker, so feel free to um, come in. The question is, is this a time to stop div divisions and have solidarity with people, unions, students, workers, and the disenfranchised and the vulnerable right across the globe? So to any speaker, feel free to come in on that. I think maybe William or Larissa might want to uh, respond, but, but, but I think we've pretty much covered that indeed. Our talk about intersectional struggles see the intersectionality of our struggles against injustices, that we cannot consider the struggle uh, of workers uh, for, for dignified living as something that's unrelated to us. We cannot see, we cannot ignore that the system that's oppressing us is becoming much more united across the world. Oppressions are much more intersectional and therefore resistances must be intersectional. And that's why I, we in the BDS movement, for example, are very focused on that. And it's not only out of a romantic or a principled ethical approach, it's also a very practical approach. Uh, divided, we cannot win. None of us can win. If the British government gets away with suppressing advocacy of Palestinian rights and new McCarthyism, no one is safe. The Black justice movement is not safe. The LGBT justice movement, the women's rights movements, the workers' rights, no one is safe. If, if the 1% get away with this level of repression, no one is safe. So safety and dignity means we fight together for justice. Thank you so much, Amar. I completely agree. Um, another question. Palestinian Samoud is legendary. Our Samoud will be sustained not only by our sense of right and justice, but by a sense of hope of victory for justice. So what gives you hope? I'm going to pick, I'm going to start off um, with Ben on this question. Um, this is interesting. I, I put this question in a recent event to, to Omar and I was trying to remember what you said in response, because I think I, I said in response to what you said and generally speaking on behalf of every, everybody in the movement and speaking as somebody within the solidarity movement, look, there are times, you know, go back to what we said at the start. This is a really grim political moment. Uh, this, this has been, we have, you know, sustained a number of years where globally 
the forces of oppression, the forces of the right appear to be on the rise. And we've seen um, narratives uh, and policies um, and ideologies becoming normalized uh, that, that would, have, would have seemed impossible only a few years ago. So it's a grim moment, but what sustains me when people ask me the question, how do you sustain hope uh, in your solidarity when you look at the range of forces uh, arraigned against you and the attempts to close down and to limit your space and the attacks on the movement. I always return to what sounds like a cliche, but genuinely isn't. And people who've been out, particularly to Palestine at any point and engaged directly with Palestinian people know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and what sustains us is the courage and the endurance and the samud of the Palestinian people and the absolute refusal to submit no matter the personal cost. And we are always reminded um, of what Ben Gurion was famously um, once reported to have said, which is the defeat of the Palestinian people is inevitable because the old will die uh, and the young will forget. Um, and it is the new generations of Palestinians, the generations uh, that march in the face of bullets in Gaza, uh, the generations that continue uh, to resist across Palestine that haven't forgotten uh, and that continues to, to stand up to their rights. They don't have a choice. Um, Mahmoud Darwish once said, Palestinians don't choose to struggle. They want to live ordinary lives. But when you're denied the fundament fundamental rights you're owed as a human being, uh, then you have no choice but to struggle with those rights, uh, struggle for those rights. Um, we don't have a choice either. As long as the Palestinian people continue to resist, and they will, then it's our obligation to stand in solidarity with them. And it is that endurance that gives us hope of the inevitability of the day uh, when looking at your backdrop, we will all stand together in, in a free um, Jerusalem where everybody is living uh, with justice and with equality. Strongly hope so, I completely agree. Um, let's hear from Ahmed, what gives you hope? Well, there's so many things. It would take me an hour because I am a hopeful person. But uh, I will re repeat a story that I've said before. When I was a student at Columbia University in New York, I was a tiny little part of the South Africa anti-apartheid movement led by Black students at the time, even at then in, in the dark ages, in the 80s. But, but um, when we demonstrated, when students would pass by and ask me about my sign, abolish apartheid, do you really think apartheid will be abolished in your lifetime? My answer then was immediately no. I really don't think it will happen. South Africa, I mean, the apartheid regime is so strong, it's impossible. It will not fall in my lifetime. But regardless, I'm doing it out of a moral commitment because it means a lot to me to, to stand with the justice struggle. But it did fall in my lifetime. And that gives me immense hope. Another uh, very important moving forward is Black Lives Matter. What happened last summer in the US and across the world, this gives every one of us hope that despite centuries of oppression from slavery to Jim Crow South, Black people are still resisting, are still winning their rights by, by tooth and nail, by enormous hardship, enormous struggle, but they're continuing, they're not giving up. That gives me hope. It's not just the children in Gaza, it's not just my past activism, it's today with all these communities struggling that William mentioned some of, mm. it, it, that gives me hope. Thank you so much, Ahmad. You're definitely giving us hope today. Um, and finally, Larissa, it would be great to hear from you. What gives you hope to carry on? Oh, is Larissa here or is she? It's all right. Um, I think Larissa has left. But unfortunately, that is all we have time for for our Q&A today. Thank you for all your questions, everyone. That was a really um, great question to end on. Thank you to all our speakers, William, Larissa, Ben and Amal for being with us today. It has been an absolute honour to host you all. Thank you to PSC for co-hosting this with us tonight. And of course, a massive thank you to all of our wonderful attendees for joining us. Um, if you'd like to keep updated with our future events, please follow us on our social media platforms at kcl.sjp on Instagram, KCL Students for Justice for Palestine on Facebook and at KCL 
underscore SJP on Twitter. And of course, follow PSC. So that is at Palestine Solidarity UK on Instagram, Palestine Solidarity Campaign UK on Facebook and at PSC Updates on Twitter. Thank you again. For now, please keep resisting and keep up the good fight against all forms of racism, against apartheid and keep standing up for human rights, for justice, for freedom and for equality. Um, I wish you all a lovely evening. We've certainly had so much hope tonight. Take care and we hope to see you again at another of our, of our future events. Um, so stay tuned and take care. Thank you everyone.